This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom for our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, let's welcome our guests, Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer for Fairwinds Energy Education, and Mark Pendergrast, the author of the book I have here in my hand, Japan's Tipping Point, Crucial Choices in the Post-Fukushima World. Now, let's start by in the present moment and where we are. We're, uh, we're 17 days from the second anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi triple meltdown. So, Arnie, could you refresh our memory and put it in context here of what we're talking about? Well, I think the, um, for, for the Japanese, uh, they call it 311, March the 11th. Their yeah. 311 was as traumatizing to that nation as our 9-11 was to us. You know, they have to, we have to remember um, they lost uh, about 30,000 people in the tsunami. Um, then they had, you know, four nuclear plants blow up and uh, um, radiation gets spread throughout the entire country. Um, and now they had 54 nuclear plants, only two are running. So the, um, the, the entire national psyche has been um, affected by these events that happened two years ago. It's, um, it's as traumatizing for them th as our 9-11 was for us. And the consequences of that for the nuclear power industry are still uh, unknown you know, in there's, Japan. There's a, a scientific article out just this week that talks about that. You know, and the, um, what, what happened was three, three nuclear plants with operating cores blew up and another spent fuel pool uh, also blew up. And that, that's what's real. But the reality is much beyond that. You know, the, the trust that people had implicitly in, in uh, um, the, the nuclear priesthood has been shattered. In, in Japan, um, people no longer trust um, the, the people in authority. You know, they bought into this paradigm of, of, of nuclear power um, despite the fact that they were, they were bombed in World, War, in World War II. So it's almost as if this is bookends. You know, they had the, the first bookend was Hiroshima and Nagasaki starting the era. And for the average person in Japan, they want it to stop. They want the back bookend to be Fukushima Daiichi. The government, on the other hand, is, uh, is pushing to get those nuclear plants back online. And that's what's happening now. And now, Mark, you went to Japan a year and a half ago. And would you tell us ab about that? Why did you go? And, and the result was this wonderful, incomparable book. <laughs> viewers, it is the one of a kind, and it, it gives you so much information. So please, Mark, well, tell thank us. thank you very much. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went because I got a grant to go to Japan, and I actually had received the grant before the tsunami and the meltdown. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I wasn't sure I was going to end up going because the State Department was telling people not to go to Japan at all. Then they lifted the restrictions, and so I arrived exactly two months to the day after the tsunami in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I was there to mm -hmm. study their renewable energy efforts. That's why I was going in the first place. So the timing couldn't have been more interesting or in the sense that suddenly they weren't going to be using nuclear power, or at least not very much, for the foreseeable future it became very clear that nuclear power was about the stupidest thing for a place like Japan, or for anyone for that matter, but certainly in Japan, because the whole country is built on fault lines. All of the nuclear plants are on the coast, so they're all subject to tsunamis, basically. So uh, it was a very interesting experience for me to go around mostly south of where the accident had occurred but I was going to a number of different places that were doing interesting kinds of renewable energy efforts. Unfortunately, what I discovered, I was kind of naive when I went over there. I thought, oh, th the reason I was interested in going there was Japan is an island country. It has no fossil fuel of its own. Um, and clearly, in this age of global warming and with uh, oil running out, uh, they should be looking very seriously at renewable energy, but they weren't, really. 
They sort of paid lip service to it. They had some interesting programs, which I can talk about, that I was impressed with. But by and large, they weren't doing nearly enough. And that's what I came away with. And that was sort of, I called Japan the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the world because it's so obvious there that they're facing the same thing that we're all facing uh, over the next 50 years. Uh, but they're facing it sooner and more urgently, and what are they doing about it? And that's sort of the clarion warning call that I sounded in this book. And the fact is that some people have awakened, and they are, they are rallying for a change, and still that's coming, that's flattening out in, as, the year, as the second year comes up. Is that, is that the story you're telling us now? No, I'm actually somewhat encouraged. I, I'm, uh -huh. di I'm discouraged by the fact that the Abe uh, regime now, this is the, the, they rotate prime ministers in Japan uh, more quickly than in almost any country in the world. Yeah, I was seeing today that, that uh, Obama has seen about five different <laughs> prime ministers. <laughs> yeah, that gives yeah. you a good indication of how quickly things flip there. So it's hard to have a sustained uh, policy. But they did pass under Khan, who was the prime minister when I was there. He sort of became a born-again renewable energy convert uh, because of Fukushima. And uh, he said, I'm going to stay until you pass laws to put in feed-in tariffs, subsidies for renewable energy. And he was good to his word. So um, he departed soon after they passed it. But these uh, subsidies went into effect July of last year. And it's too soon to see exactly what's going to happen, but very clearly it has really juiced up their solar panel industry in a big way. I'm not sure that it's done a whole lot for any other form of renewable energy, which it should, should have, but I am encouraged. And can you explain to, to uh, our audience a little more what exactly the feed-in tariffs are? Is it government uh, subsidies? That's right. Yeah. It's a so government subsidy for forms of renewable energy. Yeah. It's more difficult for something like geothermal, which Japan has a huge uh, potential for, but which takes a long time to go into effect. And there are all kinds of rules as to what you can do and where you could put it. And most of their geothermal uh, capacity is inside their national parks. So you have to go in sort of sideways to get to it. Wind is also problematical in Japan because they don't have a continental shelf the way that we do. So they're, they're looking at trying to figure out how to float them, which nobody's successfully done yet. Mm. Uh, or, But I argue they should be putting the... Uh, the wind turbines right where the nuclear power plants were. They've already got the uh, uh, infrastructure for electricity there, and they're on the coast where there's big wind. Uh, so I think they should be doing that. But in general, you asked me to explain the feed-in tariff. It's just a subsidy, and it's to even the playing field. It's to make it uh, reasonable for people to put in uh, uh, renewable energy so that it uh, is as cheap uh, as regular uh, electricity from other sources. And I, I think we need to touch on that subsidy because, you know, as Americans, our reaction is, oh, it's a subsidy, it's bad. But, but nuclear power is so highly subsidized already, we just don't see it. The research and development, the, the, the waste on the back end, um, and the same thing is true in Japan. So when, when Mark talks about subsidizing solar, uh, in fact, it is leveling the playing field because the, the other player in this equation, nuclear power, is heavily subsidized. And when we're talking about subsidy, we're talking about tax money, right? It's, it's, whether it's the Japanese taxpayer who is, who is paying for the subsidy. Ultimately, yes, that's true. Yeah, you know, the same as here when we, we pay for the, ta the subsidies. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and in Japan, though, we have to remember that the Japanese taxpayers are going to pay to clean up Fukushima Daiichi. And that's easily half a trillion dollars U.S. that are going to come out of their, uh, their taxes over the next 20 or 30 years. And that's a hidden subsidy to the nuclear power industry as well. It's, um, so, yeah, the, the feed-in tariffs and, and subsidizing renewables levels the playing field because otherwise the, the nuclear plants uh, appear to be cheap, 
But when you just peel back, you can find all sorts of hidden subsidies. Well, Mark, when, when you talk about solar in Japan, you contrast uh, something about the government pay, uh, government control or private control, the difference between government control of, of solar or private control. Could you explain that a little more? Well, I don't think you're going to have government controlling it. Uh, there's a, the most wealthy man in Japan is named uh, Son, S-O-N, and he, he has sort of like the, uh, he's kind of like the Bill Gates of Japan. He runs a huge software company called SoftBank. Mm -hmm. He's gotten fully behind uh, renewable energy, and he started a renewable energy institute. They have, uh, I hope that they'll invite you to go speak there, actually. <laughs> they ought to. Um, and he's put a lot of money behind uh, building uh, almost philanthropical uh, uh, solar panel arrays or, around the country. Uh, so I think that there's, and, and, you know, it used to be that Japan was the leader in the world in producing solar panels. Sharp is the first uh, major company in the world to produce solar panels, but because they let it slide for so long, they lost world leadership, they weren't using very many themselves. Now they're fighting uh, very hard to try to take business away from China. Uh, Arnie, you, you should talk to about uh, the, the strained relationship between Japan and China is a problem in terms of what's going on also. The geopolitics of the region are fraught right now, and uh, I'm not sure how that's all going to play out with renewable energy efforts. Yeah, we're talking about historical issues that go back for hundreds of years. Um, but they, they seem to be um, increasing after a period of relative calm. Uh, there's a couple of uninhabitable islands out in the middle of the South China Sea. And a, a group of nationalistic Japanese went out and climbed on the islands. And that, of course, enraged the, the Chinese, who also believe the islands belong to them. And the Chinese have now sent out uh, first fishing ships, then the Japanese sent out Coast Guard cutters, and then the Chinese sent out destroyers. And now there's airplanes with with pilots locking radar on each other. So it's, a, it's an escalating area. And um, why is all this uh, interest in a couple of uh, uninhabitable islands in the middle of the South China Sea? And the reason is that under them is oil. I'm sorry, I haven't seen this in, in the media. Um, no, um, it's, it's not well covered in the American no. media. It is in Japan because this... The same nationalistic tendencies on these islands are what got the new prime minister elected. He's very nationalistic, Abba, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he's um, very um, pro-nuclear. He and he is he's pro-nuclear in the sense, the immediate sense that he might reopen the nuclear power plants. Well, you know, when the accident happened, there was 54 operating plants, and um, all of them shut down. And after 11 months, um, the Japanese government pushed very hard to get two running um, just because they didn't want to go a year without nuclear power. But 54 nukes were shut down for 11 months, two started up, and those are the only two running. They, to, to the Japanese credit, they have reformed the regulation um, and created something like what we call the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They call it the NRA, no relation to the gun, gun lobby. But um, they are, um, they're playing hardball. And they're saying, we're not going to start these plants up until we're sure they're safe. And, and as Mark said, th there's so many seismic faults on that island that uh, every time they f go look at a nuclear plant, they find it's undermined by a, f uh, by a fault. And what the regulators are saying now is that, well, that's not an active fault. That's what the utilities are saying. But these regulators are saying, yes, it is. So they're arguing not over whether or not this nuclear plant's built on a fault, but whether it's moved in the last 50,000 years or not. This is mind-boggling and, and put in the context also that North Korea has had their third nuclear bomb test mm -hmm. and uh, the, it's built, the nuclear uh, issue is building up in the Middle East with Iran. Even today the news was that they're enriching uranium 
for not for the reason of nuclear power reactors, but for bomb making. So well, and I've got to say, I don't trust the Japanese government right now because they they clearly are pro nuclear. They're pro oil. They're pro all the things that they really need to not be doing right now. The electric companies themselves badly need reforming, and I thought that might happen by now, but it doesn't appear to be. They have 10 different utilities which all have monopolies in their regions. Half of them can't communicate with the others at all because their electricity is at a different cycle. So uh, the first thing they need to do is to get everything to match so that they can trade electricity back and forth in a, in a decent infrastructure. They don't even have that right now. Um, the, one of the things I discovered, and that I, the book is actually kind of funny uh, in a lot of ways, because um, it's all, sort of like a Monty Python skit. Often they'll they'll uh, they'll talk real big about all these wonderful things they're doing, but when you come right down to it, it turns out it's all sort of smoke and mirrors. And, and so I. I am very encouraged by the new subsidies, the feed-in tariffs, but I'm suspicious about what it's really going to mean on the ground and whether and who's who's making money from it and what kind of uh, real issues are going on. And I'm not too clear about that. Tell us a little more about the woman that you dedicated the book to, because this is uh, on a very positive note. This woman mm -hmm. is is very very much charged up with the, mm -hmm. the idea of, of renewable energy, as opposed to nuclear energy. Tell us about her. Her name is Chiaki Katata, and she is married to an American, mm -hmm. uh, and she was a uh, she worked for the Los Angeles Times for a number of years, in the Tokyo bureau. And she was like a godsend to me, among other things, because I don't speak Japanese. And she was my translator. She helped to arrange all the people I saw. And I went to uh, six different places within Japan. But she was also, it turns out, very thoughtful. And sh she told me uh, what I just told you, basically. She said, be careful. In Japan, they will make everything look good. But underneath, it's not so good. Um, so uh, I dedicated the book to her. Uh, I called her uh, a, a dragon lady, who, or she pretends to be a dragon lady because she wanted to be sort of fierce and set limits on, you know, I'm a, I go home now. <laughs> but she was uh, absolutely wonderful and became a good friend by the time I left. And you know, I, I think what Mark said is fascinating, and that's about the not trusting the government. Um, Japan can, has the technology to reprocess nuclear fuel. And they've got lots of nuclear fuel to reprocess. And reprocessing strips out the plutonium. So um, just like Iran, they could strip out the plutonium and make a nuclear bomb in less than a year. So if the tensions with North Korea grow, or if the tensions with China grow, they have enough plutonium to make easily a thousand nuclear weapons on the order of a year or two. Now, by constitution, they're prohibited from doing that. But one of the things this new uh, leadership is, is doing now is talking about changing the constitution so they can be um, um, less of a defensive force. Yeah, and they call it the self-defense force. They're military now. They don't even call it an army. Right. So, so the, the new constitution um, may open a, a, a door for the Japanese to take this nuclear fuel and reprocess it to make plutonium weapons with. Um, it's very important for the Americans to, to um, have a presence that, so the Japanese are assured that we'll protect them. The minute the Japanese are not assured that we'll protect them, um, they can protect themselves if they want. And even today, Abe is visiting with President Obama on all of these issues. And there's talk about uh, so many millions of dollars to be uh, used for the infrastructure in Japan. And what do, you, what do you think, having been there, what do you think is the infrastructure there? Well, uh, what, what is considered the infrastructure? 
Well, the most important need they have is to fix their electrical infrastructure so that the two systems can at least talk to each other. Um, and I don't know whether Abe wants to talk about that with Obama or not. I think, you know, Obama is a smart guy and he would like to see more renewable energy in this country, but he's also supporting various fossil fuel initiatives and nuclear initiatives that make me very uncomfortable. So Obama's not going to be the great hero in the story, I'm afraid. I, I do want to, do, do you want to talk briefly about some of the good things that I saw happening in Japan? I would love to I, I talk about that. I don't want to just totally dump on them. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, your, your book does read as, as an adventure uh -huh. to me. Well, it was. I, I called it Mark's Adventures in Japan Land. <laughs> but uh, I've got a picture up here that uh, you might want to show. It, these are electric bicycles that are uh, fueled by the solar panels you can see on the top there. So you can, you can rent them. This is in Kitakyushu, which is their equivalent of what used to be Pittsburgh in this country. It used to be the big steel town, still is, mm -hmm. but it was terribly polluted. And now it's cleaned up. Uh, so I was impressed with Kitak Yushu. And I like, uh, I like these, uh, this system. Um, is that the Echo City? That is the Echo, that's one of the Echo Cities. I, I, I was going to six of them, yeah, Kitak mm -hmm. Yushu being one of them. And this was the guy who took me around in the uh, hybrid car, the plug-in hybrid. Uh, and oh, this is a, a good example of just one of the, the silly things they're doing. It's a complete waste of, of money. This, this is a hydrogen-powered uh, bicycle. It's so heavy that it needs those two front uh, wheels. This is me uh, trying it out in Kitakyushu. And it costs something like a million dollars, and it's a toy. Uh, and I'm convinced that hydrogen... I've gotten into trouble for saying this to people, by the way, Arnie, that I think that hydrogen power is a total wrong path to go down. I think it's extremely expensive, and it's something that they have used for years to sort of delay uh, supporting electric vehicles. But anyway, that's, that's my Arnie, theory. do you want to jump in on no, that? No, I would agree. I, I, <laughs> okay. You know, it's one of those technologies that's always 10 years away. Yeah. And it, you get 10 years out, and it's another 10 years before they get it right. You're right. It's very heavy and hard to transport. And oh, by the way, hydrogen does blow up. Yes, it blows up. And by the way, in order to produce pure hydrogen out of water, for instance, you spend more energy than you get back when you turn it back into water. Duh. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really doesn't make any sense. These are some uh, uh, wind turbines that I saw uh, in Japan. And the, as I say, the problem in Japan is they have these huge uh, winds, you know, uh, uh, tornadoes. Uh, and so uh, Mitsubishi, I was very impressed when I met with those folks. They make some really innovative uh, wind turbines. And I'm hoping that the subsidy is going to help them to come forward more because these things were made in Denmark and uh, two of them were out of commission because uh, they had broken, uh, because they weren't built for the kind of conditions in Japan. You know, Mitsubishi also makes their nuclear reactors. Um, so the, the, it, it's fascinating because in Germany, the Germans walked away from nuclear. And then by 2022, 20, there will be no more nuclear in, in Germany because the German industry understands that the way of the future isn't nuclear power, it's renewables. But yet in, it, it's exactly the opposite in Japan. The, the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is still pushing very hard on the nuclear power front. And they're pushing hard because they want to sell it outside of Japan. They're convinced that they're going to provide China and the rest of Asia with nuclear power plants. That's the sort of subtext of the politics of why they're so... I don't think that they really think that they're going to do a whole lot in Japan anymore. Mm -hmm. But they do see that they're going to go somewhere outside of it, or they hope so. And also Mitsubishi is oil. Mitsubishi oil is the, one of their primary mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, nobody has really faced the stark reality that peak oil has already happened in all likelihood. We've gotten as much out of the ground as, and now it's going to be diminishing returns. And the more it diminishes, the more we're going to pay for it. We're staving that off by fracking, which I think is a disaster. Uh, 
but it's made everything cheaper for a while here, but it's not going to last. And nobody, everybody keeps kicking the can down the road. Um, I hope that Obama and Abe discuss these matters because uh, they're two of the big powers in the world, and, and at least, you know, Obama talked out loud about climate change issues, uh, which are very important. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and show us some more positive things. Now, now we, we have to wind down <laughs> here in time. Yeah, just tell me, tell me when to stop. Uh, I'm just going through these pictures in no particular order. This is the strait between um, the main island of Japan and uh, Kyushu, which is where Kita Kyushu is. And there's a very big current that runs through there every day. They're looking into the possibility of uh, tidal power, uh, which is still very much in its infancy, but which is intriguing to me. And in fact, I ran into some Swedish guys there who were hired to look at that issue in, in Japan. And Mark, I ran into the ghost of FDR up at the Bay of Fundy mm -hmm. with the tidal power, mm -hmm. right? I mean, exactly. he was up there looking from his summer home there at Campobello. Mm -hmm. What all of that power in the Bay of Fundy? Still to come, right? Still, Still in his embassy. And th it's know. happening in a few places, but, but not too many. Um, those are, uh, th this is a tunnel going towards the little uh, uh, island village that I visited called Yusuhara. But I wanted to show it because the Japanese are capable of, of great engineering feats, so they could be doing the geothermal that I was talking about. Um, they're, they're doing uh, a lot of wood chip industry, which makes no sense whatsoever, it turns out, because they have monocultures of these tall, skinny Japanese cedars, and they want to get rid of them. Um, here's the Yusuhara. Um, but what they should be doing is heating with, this w heating with the wood directly, not chipping it and trying to sell it for, for very expensive uh, wood chip uh, furnaces, which no one buys. But this, this guy um, was a farmer. He's 67 years old, and he's a dying breed, as they are in the United States. But he heats uh, partially with wood, uh, and it would be so easy for them to go back to the old ways of doing that. But Japan, they're, they're all hepped up on. They have to be totally modern, and they don't want to be seen as doing anything old-fashioned. Uh, so a lot of what they're doing just doesn't have a whole lot of logic to it, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, on that note, I think we have to wind down now. And, and, uh, and Arnie, would you keep us, uh, would you tell us about what's happening in the beginning of March? Yeah. In New York City? <clears throat> well, the, the second anniversary of the um, nuclear accident is March 11th. And the uh, Caldecott Foundation is sponsoring a two day seminar on the 11th and 12th. And it's uh, at the New York Academy of Medicine. And the symposium is titled uh, The Medical and Ecological Consequences of the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Accident. Um, that's 60 bucks for two days, including two lunches. Um, students are half that. Um, there's still a couple of seats left. Uh, there's 300 total seats in the auditorium. And you, um, you will be there. There'll be 18 experts, some dose people. Um, Khan, the, the former uh, pr uh, prime minister, will be the kickoff speaker, and I'll be following uh, him. And um, uh, so we'll be able to look at the doses and look at the consequences already in the animal population and kids with thyroid cancers and all and bring it out to the American media's attention just how serious this accident is. Mm -hmm. Yes, and on that uh, heavy note, which is what this is all about, except that we have to keep on going, isn't it so, Mark, uh, to keep on going and learn more about it mm -hmm. and so that the future can open up for all of us I and for so. future generations. So I certainly do hope so. And I hope that you can return another time and, and come back also, Arnie, with, with better news the next time. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for b being on our program today. Thank you. And uh, uh, on this, uh, there, there's a flyer that will be, should be on the screen about uh, remembrances of Fukushima in the United States. 
it's an ongoing problem. And thank you all for viewing. Goodbye for now.